scriptures up to John chapter 9. I'm going to be sharing, um, oh, as I journeyed through this story again, God revealed new insights and new thoughts. And um, I had done a sermon on this chapter years, over a decade or more ago. And um, I looked back at it, and the stuff God was showing me this time around had nothing to do with what he showed me last time around. And there are things that I, I can't get to everything with the time that we have, but um, I know he'll continue to unpackage and unveil this to us. Um, as I'm talking and sharing, as there are things that he reveals to you, um, nudges you in, uh, shares with you, be open to receive that. And I would love to hear your thoughts um, afterwards to, to hear what else God has been working as we talk through this. I'm going to be reading, uh, we're going to literally go through this chapter. I'm not going to read every single verse, but we'll go in sections and we'll see where we land as we go. As Jesus, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pole of Siloam. This means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. All right, so right off the bat. Now, we just finished chapter 8. And if you were with us last week... We just had an example of people who brought, the Pharisees who brought the woman, caught in adultery to Jesus. I have no doubt his disciples were hanging around the courts, seeing all this happen. And we see how the Pharisees saw the woman as a problem to deal with, not a person, and how Jesus turned that around, treated her with compassion and love, and set her on a different path. That just happened, apparently, in the sequence of order here. And now we have the disciples come upon this man born blind from birth, and the first thing they think about is a theological problem. The first thing they mention is, tell us why he was born blind. Now, they knew, clearly, Jesus could heal. He could help. He could raise the dead to life again. Why wasn't that their first question? Why wasn't that their first thought with this man. Here's what gets me. Here they had been seeing Jesus teaching. They've been hanging around Jesus every day, watching him in action, heard him, and they still don't get it. Now there's a saying that values are best caught rather than taught, right? So it's the best way to pass on something that is valuable, a, a, a value that's intrinsic in you, is not so much what you teach, not so much what is said, as what is seen in action, what is experienced when in a good relationship with someone. It's why mentoring is so effective. It's not so much what they teach. It's that positive relationship. Those values that the person holds within them is passed on in that relationship. And why relationships for us as parents, as neighbors, as co-workers, as Christians, more than anything we say, it's who we are in a relationship with others that has the greatest impact, that conveys love and compassion more effectively. But here are the disciples. They've been in close relationship with Jesus Christ. They have not only heard him taught, but they've walked with him. And eventually, of course, they get it, kind of, sort of, after the cross, um, they end up changing the world. They end up going out and sharing who Jesus is and the love. But there are a lot of misses that they had along the way before landing it. And before we, you know, I read this and that was my first thought. What these, I can't wait to meet these disciples up in heaven because they're world changers that were just a tad slow on the uptake. But before we get too harsh on them, we could probably take some encouragement from them. Because how many times have you heard yourself saying, man, if I could just talk with Jesus, if I could just walk with him, just have that one-on-one -on -one personal time, I would understand so much more. If he was just here in front of me, I would know what he wanted my life to be about. I would know what he wanted me to do. But the reality is these disciples had that. They had that every day with him. And he was, they were still human. They still had a choice to make. They just like us, in our 
getting God, we don't always land it. Our self-focused tracks, I think, keep us, like the disciples, our self-focused tracks sometimes keep us from seeing the needs of those around us, keep us from seeing people beyond the surface and making actionable choices to try on Jesus' ways, which Jesus was all about reaching out in love, finding a way to serve and help, and to leave a person feeling more blessed because he was there with them, God in and through us. I think in this very first verse that we look askance at the disciples, we should pause and say we're all in process. We're all in process. We can't beat ourselves up and we can't beat someone else up because they haven't arrived yet, because they haven't finished being written like a book. None of us have been finished being written. The book is not over. The book's not ended. And we have to remember that. And hopefully as we do, the gentler we'll be with ourselves and with others and a step closer to getting to how Jesus loved and how he wanted to pass on that love to us. But apart from that, let's address the theological question that he had. they had. So Rabbi, tell us, this man blind from birth, who sinned, his parents, or was he born blind? Now, if you want to look at why they were asking this question, there's a couple, if Jewish theologians back then had a couple theories on, on how man and sin worked. And we've heard, of course, did his parents sin? You've heard from Deuteronomy and the Old Testament that when the sin of a parent, it gets passed on generation to generation, to the third and fourth generation. And you can see that in alcoholism or abuse. That, it, that, that does happen. And there's actually epigenetics. The way you eat, the way you eat while you're pregnant, um, actually, the junk food that gets in there, it can affect the genetic makeup of your child and what they will start craving and what their life will be like. So when you pass on, you pass on things through the ge generations. But apart from that, okay, so that's one side of it, but how do they possibly ask, if this man was born blind, how do they possibly think he sinned then and that sin caused his blindness? Well, there's two theories that were uh, about that time. Some believed that you could actually have prenatal sin, that while you were in the womb, you could sin. I don't know if it's like hitting the womb really hard. <laughs> You're like, Ugh. I don't know, but that was one theory. Another more prevalent belief, though, was that there was a preexistence of soul. Now, the Jewish theologians who believed this back during that time likely borrowed it from Plato and the Greeks, that was a common thought, that souls existed before the creation of the world. Now, Greeks believed that all souls were good. All the souls were good. And what made them bad was when they occupied a human body. And this is why they were absolutely blown away by the idea of a God who was perfect, how he could possibly have entered into a human body, how far he would go so that we might know him. The Jews believed that souls came in options. You could have a good soul or a bad soul. And it was just by luck of the draw, depending on which one you got. If you were lucky and you got a good soul, then you're going to lead a good life and not have to worry about sin so much. If you're a bad soul, then likely you've already sinned before you even entered the body because you're just bad. You're a rebellious little sinner. And that was, that was the view. So this man... Having been born blind, having been already sinning, they would have thought then, okay, he must have gotten option B, bad soul. And that's why he could have sinned before he was even born, which you find at the end of the story when the Pharisees give their last final insult, this is exactly what they're saying. You were a bad egg from the beginning. So that's where it comes from. So you look at this idea of soul, the preexistence of soul or prenatal sin, and you're thinking, Wow, isn't it funny where ancient beliefs come from and where do they get that? Where do they come up with this? And surely if Jesus was about spirit and truth, surely he would address this issue. Certainly here's an opportunity to address the untruth that was coming from his own disciples to deal with the wrong religious thought that seemed very counter to a God who created us. But what would we find Jesus doing? He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. He completely sidesteps the issue altogether. Instead of Jesus going there, he doesn't argue these ideas. He doesn't counter the misguided theology. 
Instead, Jesus moves to a ground that would more quickly help them see the heart of God. He helps them connect with something that possibly his own disciples could relate to in their own lives, suffering. So essentially, he says this suffering, it's not because of sin. It's here so that the work of God can be seen. And he's telling his disciples, take a different perspective. See what's going on here. See it not as a bad thing, but as something that good can come out of. And I have no doubt the disciples could relate. They'd already been experiencing suffering and persecution from those who were against them, and they were going to experience a whole lot more in their lives coming up. And here Jesus was offering them encouragement, saying, don't stand apart from this man and analyze him as a theological problem. All mankind suffers. So instead, start looking at suffering as an opportunity that God's going to use to show his power. It's all a matter of perspective. And I think it's a perspective you and I can definitely use in our own life situations. What's a situation in your life that seems so many times to be debilitating and keeping you from the fullness of living life? It may be a relationship It may be a work-related circumstance. It may be your finances. It may be temptations that you're struggling with or school issues or loneliness that you're experiencing. Whatever it is that you put a label on as badness that blinds you from, from really seeing and experiencing life, Jesus is saying, try on another concept. Try seeing that situation as a stage, as a stage that's being set for God to be displayed, where the divine is going to debut his work and show his wonder. Whether the situation is because of your own choices, wrongly made, rightly made, or because of situation is outside of your control, however it is, you are here. This is keeping you from living fully, and God is saying, I'm going to show up. So keep this stage wide open because I'm going to be showing you my power, I'm going to be showing you my provision, and I'm going to show you my presence. I'm going to show up. And this, pre- this perspective makes sense. When um, we had our first play for the College Park Neighborhood Arts and Theater Center, uh, I was a part of helping them get the set together. And it was a very exciting, very messy, very hardworking day. So you come to the stage, and everyone who's volunteered has come together, and it is a mess. Putting a stage together for a play before you get that beautiful set all ready for the play to debut, it's a mess. There are boards everywhere as they're trying to put up the walls, and and there's sawdust, and there's spilled paint, and there's cans that you're tripping over, and everyone has to come together to bring it together, and there's begging, and there's borrowing, there's stealing to make sure the stage and the props all get in place at just the right amount of time. But the process is messy. And it doesn't look very good, and it doesn't feel very good as the clock keeps ticking along, and it's not ready yet. We had a a version of this getting ready for Easter, figuring out how to hang the curtain there and and how to swoop the the curtains here. And Gloria and Nelson and and Ariel had their minds going, and, and there were things all over the place until you guys came in and the stage was set, ready to receive God. When you're working on a set, getting it ready, there's excitement too, isn't there? There's excitement and there's anticipation of what's to come. You look at the mess, you look at the boards, the sawdust, the spilled paint, you look at the time that's ticking away and the long hours and you're saying, you know what, but this is worth it because we know what's coming. We know what's coming. What if our life, what if we could look at our own lives in that same perspective? Our problems, our struggles, that is a stage that's being prepared to receive God. He's going to show up. The spotlight is going to come on because he is the light of the world. And he's going to do something great in us, through us, for us, that will reveal his power, his presence, and his provision. If we could possibly take these words, he's saying this has happened so that the work of God might be displayed in life, then that means that what our lives are going through right now is preparing the stage for God to be displayed. And perhaps our language, if we could fully grasp that perspective, our language might change a bit to anticipate this. Language affects attitude. And we can have our belief here that God can do anything, God is all-powerful, but what comes out of our mouth? If it's worry, if it's doubt, if it's questions, if it's, again, wrestling, wrestling verbally over and over and over again, 
that counteracts that faith and that assurance in God. What we speak builds up or tears down the strength of our hearts and our faith. And it's so much easier to speak words of worry and doubt more than faith and trust. But then you flip over to Philippians. Flip over to Philippians. Did you get that? Flip over to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Switch out the anxious for the anticipation. Switch out the worry for the thanksgiving. He says, give your troubles in word and action, in prayer and petition, and peace will be yours. You will get something out of it. God is coming. He is going to de debut his great works in your life. Anticipate it. I love the next verse as we go down. We go down, and, and God says, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, there's a lot of uh, interpretations of what Jesus meant here, but what, I, what popped out to me was the inclusive we that Jesus used. He didn't say, he didn't say um, as long as it is day, I must do the work of him who sent me. He used the inclusive we. We have the work that Jesus, that God sent me to do. And as long as it is day, we must work before night is coming. It could be referring literally to night and day. You work during the day, you sleep at night. It could be referring to the cross. Before the cross is day and then the cross, God is no longer with us except his Holy Spirit comes but the bottom line is I think he's saying it's a matter of prioritization. He's realizing, it's about realizing that our time is limited. And one thing we know, whatever God has given us, we have that moment right here, right now to do whatever he's told us to do. That's all we know. There's a sundial in Glasgow that has a motto on it. It says, take thought of time before time is ended. Take thought thought of time before time is ended. Don't put off tomorrow what you know to do, to be, to say, to experience today. Live your moments here and now aware and engaged in your relationships, in what God nudges you to do, in showing love, in bringing the light to those God has put in our lives and sends us to. And then the I am the light of the world, he shows us then that what he does when we take those moments with him light comes into our lives. And he does a very practical, experiential thing right then and there with a man who was born blind. He says, this is the time we have. We need to make the most of it. I'm the light of the world. This is how it works. And he heals the man. Now, he uses a methodology. And this is, I had the youth over to my house. We do it every other week. And a little plug, we do now Elizabeth and uh, the group. They meet over here every other week as well. So we'll, we'll get a schedule out to you. It's every other Saturday and Friday that the youth meet. Um, but last night, they were at my house, and we went through John 9, and it was great. Besides playing Ninja, which is a great game, <laughs> and Eric is an awesome Ninja guy, um, Slava, they kept heading it off. Um, besides Ninja, and what else did we play? Tur trees, some Italian game where you like are trees and leaves that blow, very metaphorical. Um, anyway, we had a good time discussing chapter 9. We ate pizza and discussed chapter 9. And what um, I love are the insights of the youth. And throughout this, I have interspersed some of those insights because I'm like, wow, hang on. What did you just say? Let me write it down. Well, what I'm about to share was not one of those wows, but it was just so hilarious. I had to share it anyway. Okay, so he's using spit, right? Spit to mix with mud. And what do you think the first thing that comes to their mind? Like, how do you get that much spit? How do you get that much spit to make clay? So they came up with a couple ideas. They said, well, perhaps, you know, he said, I'll be right back. I need to go drink some water, and then I'll have enough spit. It's just not recorded here. They said, well, perhaps the disciples carried around a little vat, and from time to time Jesus spit in it, and he would have it on reserve for when he needed to <laughs> do some healing. Very practical-minded. And then we had uh, one of them right off the top was like, look, if he could stop a storm, a bunch of water, he could certainly make more spit happen in his mouth. It's just a matter of water. 
I loved it. The things you learn. Well, spit, I did a little bit more research besides talking to the youth um, about spit in the ancient world. And uh, what we find, it was rather um, <clears throat> revered. Spit was revered in the ancient world, especially if it was someone that was distinguished that was doing the spitting. And it was believed that spit or spittle, but I think of spittoons when I think of spittle, so I'll just say spit, was believed to have curative qualities. It could cure, it could heal. This was what believed. There was a story by historian from the first century Rome, Tacitus. Uh, he told a story of Roman Emperor Vespasian who visited Egypt. And when he was there, two men approached him, saying that their God had sent them and advised them to go to Vespas Vespasian, if I'm pronouncing that right, and get healed. One of them was blind. And this blind man asked the emperor to please moisten his eyeballs with his spit so that he could see. And the story is recorded in the history books that this Roman emperor did that. He didn't want to. He didn't want to, but he was finally convinced to do it. He did it, and the man could see. Now, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Those historians can't really rely on them back then, especially as storytellers, right? <clears throat> Except we now see Jesus doing a similar thing, right? You think, well, well that's Jesus. That's God. God, Jesus, he can do whatever he wants. Well, how do we know that God didn't do that through Vespasian as well? I'm just throwing it out there. Either way, whatever you believe or don't believe on that, it was a common belief back then that spit could heal ma many ailments, including poison from a snake. If you got bit by a snake, just spit on it and you'll be fine. There was a, a Roman uh, collector of scientific information, Pliny. He has a whole chapter on what spit can do to help you. Uh, it can cure crooks in your neck. You wake up on the wrong side of the bed, have someone spit on it. <laughs> Leprosy, very effective in averting the evil eye being upon you. So when your spouse is about to give you that look, <laughs> spit. I'm sure that will help the argument. We laugh, right? Spit, what? But when your finger gets burned or you hurt it, what's the first thing you do? You stick it in your mouth. Now, is it because of the spit or that's just instinct because your mom did it? Or <laughs> I don't know, but it's kind of interesting, isn't it? We know today that spit can't cure snake bites. Right, Chuck? Okay. <laughs> Here's another opportunity. Jesus, who is God, he could have corrected this wrong thinking, right? Surely Jesus knew what was false and what was true about what really healed a person. He would do what was right because he says over and over that he only does what the Father in heaven tells him, the one true God tells him to do. And then we find him using spit, a common custom and belief of the day, as a part of the healing process. And that's not the only time. There's another instance in Mark where he used spit to heal. Why? Why would Jesus not correct this belief? Why would he use spit as part of a healing? I thought about this, and I thought, well, maybe like Paul, Jesus was being all things to all men so that some might be saved. Or perhaps... And using common practices of the day, he was able to raise the expectation of his patient who lived in that time and place, gain the confidence, so to speak, of the patient that this man, Jesus, knew what he was doing. Maybe he met him where he was at and where this man was in his life. He needed that common ground first to start in his faith walk, which would lead him then to the next state, steps of faith and belief. Whatever reason, Jesus used it. He engaged with something that we know now is a misguided belief. He engaged with this common practice and custom in order to do good. I read this, and I am wowed by Jesus' openness with culture and beliefs. You cannot read this and look at this and see Jesus in any other way except he was clearly not arrogant about what truth he had and knew. 
Jesus was not arrogant, neither did he demand that others stop believing what they thought was truth, even when falsely held. He did not demand this, and he was not disdainful of someone else's understanding. To the contrary, Jesus stepped in and embraced the customs and beliefs of the day where and how he could. To me, that is an incredible grace-filled approach. Not operating out of arrogance, not operating out of fear, but so confident was Jesus in who God is that he knew that this custom, spit mixing with mud, this custom would not deter the truth of God shining bright when it needed to be seen. That to me is winsome holiness. Winsome holiness. And I wonder how you and I can do and be more of that in our own lives. How can we be as winsome with others' beliefs and understandings? Not fearful that when we find bridges to them, not fearful that we'll look like we're giving up on truth, not fearful that we're going to be giving into the world or deceit or fearful that we'll be seen as wishy-washy or too accommodating or not standing firm. Perhaps instead of fear, it's confidence in God that we start with. How can we be so confident in who God is and what we believe that we can operate as Jesus did? That we can find places of connection, taking and using what works for the mind, the soul, the spirit, the customs and traditions that don't always look like us. How can we look and find the beneficial and the harmless so that we can work with another, we can enter realms that others are suspect of and not be afraid because our God knows what matters most. And what matters most is the person. What matters most is the heart. What matters most, and we see clearly here with Jesus, is an opportunity for relationship. God knew how to bridge between what is God and what is not God. He stayed in tune with the one true God and gave discernment on when to use and when to step and when not to. And so God sought ways to bridge, to bring together, to see beyond the boxes of religion to the God ability beyond those boxes that were set up. To know authentic love, when there's authentic love, there is no fear. How might that affect how we relate with other religions? How might that affect how we relate with other people's beliefs and practices? How might that affect how we operate with differences in our own Christian religion, differences of theology, differences of belief? How do we allow someone to have differences and still seek ways to bridge and love and have relationship with? It's challenging. There's a chapter in the Bible that says there's three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. But that's not how the Pharisees saw it. That's not how the Pharisees saw it. But we're getting ahead of the story. In verses 13 through 16, verses 16, 13 through 16 is when we have the man. He's been healed. He goes from the pool. He heads out. And all the neighbors and friends and other Jews around that area are like, who, what? Who, this is not the same man. This is not possibly the same man. How is he blind? And now he sees. And so they started asking. They were so shocked. Some believed it was a different man. Some said, no, it's the same man. He's really been healed. And they started asking the questions, asking for the details. And as we read further, I can't help but feel that these guys were spies for the religious authorities because they kept asking, well, who did this? Who was it? And when they found out it was Jesus, how did he do it? Well, it was confirmed. It was Jesus and he healed. And guess what day it was on? The Sabbath, right? And so these nasty little narcs go and report to the Pharisees. They go running to the Pharisees with this man as evidence. Look, we've got more against this man, Jesus. The Pharisees, I actually like this verse. The Pharisees, it says, um, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath, verse 16. But others asked, well, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. How many times do you read in the Bible that the Pharisees were divided, right? They are usually all seemingly all in against Jesus. But here we have, there were some that actually were open. They sincerely wanted to know if Jesus was legit or not. And some believed and some did not. But the focus of the story is of those who didn't believe, who heard that Jesus, what he did, what he said, 
And they said, that cannot be of God. That cannot be of God. He's breaking the Sabbath again. So obviously he can't be God because he doesn't fit into our understanding of how God works. This is how God works. That is outside of this. That is not God. You see how their logic went? So Jesus, of course, comes along, God himself, and he's operating outside of their box to understanding. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Well, their box said you can't work on the Sabbath. Their box said you make clay, that's working. Neither can you wear sandals on the Sabbath if you have nails that hold the sandals together because the nails are like weighted and that's going to be carrying weight on your foot. And that's work. So you can't wear sandals with nails. And you can't cut your fingernails. And if you have a hair that's gray and you're like, oh, no, someone's going to see this and you want to pull it out, you can't do that because that's work on the Sabbath. And healing is not okay on the Sabbath. Healing Now, if someone's about to die, you can bring them back from the brink of death and then leave them there until Sabbath's over. Now, if you had a way to make them even better, no, 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 you can't do that. Just make sure they don't die. If you have a broken arm, a dislocated leg, you're going to have to wait till the sun sets. So clearly, a man blind from birth was not a life and death situation. Not a life and death situation. Completely outside their box of what God wanted, completely outside their box of what God would allow and what God would do. The healing couldn't be further from needing to be done, but Jesus does exactly what they think God wouldn't do. The lesson for us, I think it's dangerous when we define concretely who God is and what God can or cannot do. We tread on the ground of the Pharisees when we are walking in limiting our understanding as to what we can grasp and what makes sense to us, and therefore we limit God like they did. Jesus, who was God, blew the lid completely off their definitions and limitations and said, you don't have the market on who I am. You don't have the market on what I can or cannot do. And he repeatedly showed this by his activity so contrary to their boxed understanding of God. We have to have a framework. Our religion, our understanding of Christianity, we have to think through what the scriptures say and how to apply them. And so all of us are going to be putting a framework about our beliefs because this is what makes sense of the world. This is how we make sense of of how we relate in our relationships, how we relate to God, how we relate to suffering, how we relate to, to our temptations. We build frameworks of belief and understanding. That's okay to do. We have to to do it. So the edges go up to help us make sense and apply these things to life. But I think what we have to remember as we see Jesus operating as God and blowing the lid off of these Pharisees' box, what we have to realize is when we create our own constructs of religion and beliefs, we have to leave the lid open. We have to leave the lid open for God to be God, to say that we do not have the final say of what God can or cannot do or be. We have to leave that open. And as long as we leave that open, our minds are going to be blown. As we continually learn, as God continually teaches us through the scriptures who he is and what he can do. So some said he's of God, some said not of God. And so what do the experts of the law do? Verse 17. They turn to the man again. Well, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. Now, I just have to read this dialogue because this is the greatest dialogue ever in the Bible because it has so much sarcasm and humor. Okay, so he turns, they turn to the man. The man replies, he's a prophet. First of all, the man started by saying he's a man, the man Jesus. Now he's saying he's a prophet. Do we see a progression of belief? The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. And when you were put out of the synagogue, you were not just banned away from community, you were banned from God. You were done. 
And so they didn't want this. And so they were fearful. And that was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, good son. Give glory to God was a common phrase saying, do not lie. Tell the truth. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Just admit it. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But the one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, well, what did he do to you? I mean, how did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Isn't that a great line? (laughs) Sticking it right to him. And then they hurled insults at him. And they said, you, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as far as this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. See that that last little insult there? You were a bad soul from the beginning. This guy was no coward and no dummy. We see this through this dialogue here. We can see that now this man has been set free. He's He's gone from blindness to sight. He's been set free. He is not going to be imprisoned again. Not by authorities, not by religion, not by anyone. He is not going to fear again. And to me, I think that's what contact with Jesus does for us, doesn't it? It sets us free from fear. God in our lives can set us free from fear of what others can do to us, to stand in the middle of attack or rejection or loneliness or conflict and speak truth that God has given us. Speak truth, live truth, and fear nothing. What I love is these next couple verses, they're so tender to me. Jesus then heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man, the Messiah? And the man says, who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. This man had just been defending Jesus Christ, had just been defending him against the religious authorities, and he did not even know he was the Messiah. He was giving up complete contact with man and giving up complete contact with God to defend Jesus. That's pretty powerful. And Jesus seeks him out, and Jesus looks at him, and he says, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you now. And to me, it's just like this movie moment, this great reveal, this tenderness. And the man says, I believe and worships him. The next line then is a little jarring because it says, well, Jesus says, for judgment I've come. You're like, Oop. what? This is so tender. For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. When you actually looked at that word judgment, it is not the act of judging. It is the result of decision making. I have come. Jesus reveals God. He says, I have come to reveal who God is. And out of that revelation, you have a decision to make. You're going to make a judgment call. Are you going to put your faith and trust in me? Are you going to believe what I'm saying? Or are you going to choose not to trust me? Will you let your eyes be opened? Or are you going to continue to live with them shut? Jesus says, I come not to judge. He said that in the previous chapter. I come not to judge. I come not to condemn. Jesus comes only to bring life. And when he brings us life, it's up to us to make a judgment call. Are we going to believe it and trust it and say yes to it, or are we going to not? And that's a choice we make every day in our lives. Not eternal. Eternal, God's got us. But every day we have a choice, a judgment call to say, are we going to trust God in our situations, in our daily struggles? Are we going to trust him to take the blindness off of our eyes and step into the light with him, or are we not? It's interesting, in conclusion, 
I'm going to go back to the beginning because I love what this shows. It's interesting that Jesus asked the man to believe, to trust, before he healed him. Jesus put the mud on his eyes, and he told him to go. Go wash at the pool of Siloam. Jesus did not heal him right then and there. He had the power. Jesus has healed already with a word, with a touch. He, he can raise people from the dead. But here he puts mud on the eyes and sends the man away. Now, John is very intentional about his writing. It was a known, the pool of Siloam was well known. It was, they had the water source out in the valley, the Kidron Valley, way outside of Jerusalem. They had built, Hezekiah back in the days had built this tunnel that led back to, so they could have water coming into Jerusalem. They didn't have to go out there in case they were attacked and the water source ended. Well, the water came in, and that was the pool of Siloam. This is where people came in Jerusalem to get their water. And so it was called Sent. Siloam was Sent. He didn't have to put that. That was known. Why did he put it? I have a theory. Jesus puts the mud and the spit mud clay on this man's eyes and tells him to go. He tells him to go, obey what I've told you to do, which was to wash. Go obey in the pool of Siloam. Go obey in the place that means sent. Now, I think of the dragging out of this ordeal for this man. Instead of a quick fix, it's prolonged. He has to make his way, still blind, from Jesus to the pool. And he has to sweat it out every step of the way on that walk. But with every step of lengthened circumstances, the stage of faith was being further set for when Jesus was going to make his debut. The man did not know this, though. All he knew was what Jesus had told him. And so every step for him was a question. Is this going to work? Who is this man, Jesus? Could he be trusted? Does he really have my best in mind? Was his hope a foolish hope? Nothing was changing. Nothing was changing on the way. Does he keep walking in faith and trust, or does he give up, go home, back to what he knew, what he was comfortable with, rather than not having something work out again? But notice all the people he passes on the way. In his blindness, in his prolonged circumstances, notice all the people he passes on the way and the people who are at the pool. The people who knew him and would see him walking with mud on his face and wonder what was going on. And I wonder how much of the dragging out of the situation for this man was for him versus how much was the dragging out for those around him. Perhaps God wanted to reveal himself and draw more than just this man to him. Perhaps he wanted as many as possible to know and see that light and life and healing and sight were available to all who would believe. And so perhaps this man's challenge was bigger than just himself. Perhaps this stage would be a stage where many would see God for who he really is, a healer, a friend, a savior of the world. It's interesting, the sequence of events, that Jesus talks to his disciples about the importance of doing the work that God had sent him to do, and anyone who follows God to do the work of him who sent him, because he's the light of the world, and he's the light that the world needs. He puts the mud on the eyes of the man, and he tells him, go, obey at the place called sent. It's as if he's saying to this man, let me just metaphorically jump here, as well as to us, you've been given sight by the light of the world, even though you don't see results fully yet, even though you don't feel any different in your situation, I have given you the light that you're going to need. I have given you what you need. Believe it and go. Go do the work of the one who sent you. Obey. And he sends him to this famous pool in Jerusalem where all these people are going to see God being debuted. And Jesus says, go obey. Go to the place and let the light of me shine so others can see me too. God's methods don't always make sense on the surface. We see this throughout the book of John. His ways do not make sense on the surface, but he always has a plan for greater good. And in this story, it was through this man's dragged out circumstances rather than a quick fix that then glory, more glory could come to God. It was in the man's going, even in his not yet wholeness, but he obeyed and went and did the work that was given him to do 
which was to wash by the one who sent him, who was Jesus, and wholeness and greater life happened for the man who was born blind and for those who saw him be healed. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. All of us have circumstances and situations in our life that we're waiting for healing, for resolution, for God to be revealed. And for many of us, I think it seems that we've been building our stages for a long time. There's lots of dust, lots of dirt, and spilled paint. And we wonder why. Why is this situation in my life being prolonged for so long? And perhaps this story gives us hope and encouragement and a challenge in these stage-setting places that what's going on, the prolonged situation, if God is allowing it to continue, then that means there is greater good still to come in you, through you, for you. So stay close to God so you don't miss out on the work that he's about to reveal. And number two, the timing may not seem right. It may not seem right to you, but perhaps the timing is less about you and more about others who will benefit from seeing God at work through you. And three, even in the midst of our circumstances, when we are told to go, when we are sent to do the work of the one who sends us to obey whatever he's told us to do, we should go do it, even when we're not yet done with our own situations. We've been told to love, to serve, and to bless, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to set the oppression, oppressed free, even in our not yetness, even while we're struggling to find the way ourselves, even when our finances and our schedules and our relationships aren't where they should be, he tells us to go, to obey, to be sent like this man, and we will be healed. We will find wholeness, and we will find the light and life while bringing it to others, because that's the God we serve, the light of the world. It's my prayer that as we review, as you think about the story, as God brings the story to mind, and, and hopefully you read through it again and let him speak to you, that our eyes and our hearts will be open and our hands will follow suit, that all that we are in contact with, wherever he sends us in our daily lives, they will see the work of God and experience the heart of God, and all of us will worship and know our great God of love. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this tremendous story. You live some wild tales with some very interesting characters, and we are so grateful that they've been collected for us to, to read, to see your heart, your amazingly, overabundantly generous rebelling against the box's heart that always and evermore seeks to love us and draw us to you. Thank you for giving us glimpses of who you are, who God is. And thank you for ever and always challenging us to stay close to you, to let your spirit be in us so that when you say go, obey, you're sent, go love, serve, and bless as I do, that we can have full confidence that that will happen as you are in us and through us. Help us stay close to you, God, and however long our situations get prolonged, knowing that you will debut your great work in us and through us in just the way it needs to be. We have faith and trust in you, God. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.